right, this is pre-algebra lesson 8-2, draw inferences from data. In this lesson, we'll be able to make inferences about a population from a sample data set. So let's start with solve and discuss it. The students in Ms. Miller's uh, cast their boats in the school-wide boat for which color to paint the cafeteria walls. Based on the data, what might you conclude about how the rest of the school will vote? So votes for new cafeteria color is shown here. Um, you can see the bulletin board with the sticky notes with the colors. And so uh, the colors represent that color uh, which students want the cafeteria walls to be painted with. So let's count the votes. How many do we have for greens? One, two, three, four. So four greens. And what else do we have? Yellow. One, two, three. Three yellow. And then uh, orange. One, two, three, four. Four orange. And let's see, blue. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve blues. And then we have red. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven red. Do we have any other colors? Twelve blues, seven red, and then four green four orange, three yellow. Okay, so what can you conclude about them? Well, we have some data here, but it's it's for Ms. Ms. Miller's class, right? So if the rest of the school votes like Ms. Miller's class, then which one would be the most vote? Which one would get the most vote? The blue, right? Because the blue is a winner in this class. So if all classes um, votes like Miss Miller's, then it will it will be the blue uh, that wins the vote. However, is this a good representative sample? It may not be, or it could be, but it may not be because it's not a random sample. So let's um, look at Armando's work. There are 12 blue votes, seven red votes. The remaining votes are four green, three yellow, and four orange. If the rest of the school votes like Ms. Miller's class, then blue will get the most votes in the school, and red will come in second. However, this may not be a representative sample because it is not a random sample. Good. So how many students are in Ms. Miller's class if everyone voted? 12 plus 4 plus uh, another 4 is 20, 27, and then 3, so that's 30. 30 students are in Ms. Miller's class. How many students voted for each color? And those are, those are our numbers. Okay. And so let's look at focus on math practices on the bottom. How can you determine whether a sample is representative of a population? How do you determine if it's representative or if it's not a good representative sample? So like we learned from last lesson, random samples of, um, of the population would give you a good representative usually. Um, there are other ways too. So how can we find a random sample in this situation? You find different random uh, samples of samples of the same size and then compare them to see how different they are from one another. Representative sample will be similar to other samples of the same size selected randomly from the same population. So instead of just letting, peop, uh, letting the students in Ms. Miller's class vote, uh, just like we learned, um, you know how we learned the steps to find a representative sample? 
um, in the last lesson. We're going to follow that step and, and give a number, a unique number for all the people in that class or all the people at school because everyone at school is gonna vote, right? And then, and then um, you just select the random numbers to select random samples from that population. That could be one way. Okay, let's look at the next page. So the lesson essential question is how can inferences be drawn about a population from data gathered from samples? So now we're gonna start making inferences. Inferences are any opinions or conclusions that we can infer, that we can uh, assume from the data. So let's look at example one. Draw qualitative inferences from data. Sasha is trying to convince her mother to change her bedtime on school nights. She gathers data on the average number of hours of sleep, but that a random sample of seventh grade students in her school get each night. Will Sasha be able to convince her mother to let her go to bed later? So let's look at um, her data. On school days, her bedtime is 9 p.m. and her wake up time is 6.30 a.m. and she uh, sleeps nine and a half hours. So that's an average number of hours of sleep um, from a random, wait, yes. So this is an average, wait. This, isn't, this is her hours of sleep. So now, um, if she gathers data on the average number of hours that a random sample of seventh grade students in her school gets each night, if it's less than this, less than what she normally has, uh, maybe she could argue that she could go to bed later instead of 9 p.m., right? If the average would be eight, then maybe she could convince her mom to, um, to, for, to adjust her bedtime to 10 p.m., you know? So step one, she's gonna display the data she collected in a dot plot. She describes the data. So there are different, there are various answers from this question. And um, she created a dot plot from her data. About half of the dots are clustered between nine and nine and a half hours. And nine and a half hours has the most dots. And the range is between eight hours and 10 uh, and fourth, one fourth hours. And so maximum minus the, the minimum would be two and one fourth hours. And so step two, she's gonna conclude that about half of the students in her sample get between nine and nine and a half hours of sleep each night, the same number she gets. So you can draw a curve to see the distribution or the shape of the data. And that's her inference. That's what she learns from data. So an inference is a conclusion made by interpreting data. She infers that about half of the seventh graders in her school get between nine and nine and a half hours of sleep each night. She will probably not be able to convince her mother to let her go to bed later, right? Because that's how her friend, that's, that's about where um, her friends uh, go to bed um, probably um, each night. So that is, that is her, that is her conclusion. So maybe she will not try convincing her mom. All right, let's look at try it. Dash collects data on the hair lengths of a random sample of seventh grade boys in his school. Um, you can see the data here. The hair length ranges from zero inches, so maybe like they just don't have hair, to four and a half inches. And these are, these are boy, the length of the boys, the hair length of the boys. Um, so they're, they're short, shorter compared to the girls. So um, uh, zero and, and three half inches, four one inches, and so on. But you can see two clusters here, right? 
So the data are clustered between what and what? See if you can um, pause the video, see if you can answer all these by yourself. Okay, are you ready? So the data are clustered between what and what? A half and two inches and between three and a half and four and a half inches. So Dash can infer from the data that seventh grade boys in his school have both short and long hair according to this data. So how does a dot plot help you, help you make inferences from data? If you look at example one, they, she also uses dot plot to see, the, to see the data distribution, right? So how does it help? It helps you see the overview of the data sample. Right, the dot plot can be used to display data collected from a sample. It shows the shape and spread of the data, which helps you interpre interpret what the data mean. So you can see the bumps where the data are clustered. You can see how the spread is um, shaped. And so that, that lets you see where the majority of your data uh, are located in. Let's look at the next example, example two. Draw quantitative inferences from data. Um, Sasha's friend, Margo, suggests that Sasha calculate the mean and median of the data set to determine whether they support her previous inferences about the population. So the mean is about nine hours and 16 minutes. She figured out the average of the whole data. The median, the 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 data that is like in the middle of everything, of the whole whole data, is nine and one fourth hours. So an inference is valid if it's based on a representative sample, and there are enough data to support it. And a valid inference is one that is very likely to be true about the population. So if you have a valid inference, it's probably true. So the mean and median support Sasha's inference that seventh graders get an average of nine to nine and a half hours of sleep each night. And she is prob probably correct. All right, example three. Compare inferences based on different samples. Margot and Ravi are also trying to get their parents to let them stay up later. They collect data about the number of hours sleep a random sample of seventh graders get each night. The two box plots show their data. Did Margot and Ravi's data support Sasha's inference about the number of hours of sleep that seventh graders get? Well, it looks like the median is, uh, the medians are the same, right? They have a box plot instead of uh, dot plots. So you know that this is, these are the medians. And then that's Q1 for, the, for Margot. Q1 for Ravi is here. Q3 for Margot and Q3 for Ravi. And then minimum, maximum are different. So the median time is nine and one fourth hours in each random sample. However, based on the box plots, Margaret and Ravi can infer that less than half of the seventh graders get between nine and nine and a half of sleep each night, looking at the box plot. So these data do not support Sasha's inference. So it may be, it may be representing uh, inferences that are a little bit different from what Sasha has. So let's look at try it. Elixis surveys three different samples of 20 students selected randomly, so it's probably a good representation of the data, from the population of 492 students in the seventh grade about their choice for a class president. In each sample, Elijah receives the fewest votes. Um, Alexis infers that Elijah will not win the election. Is her inference valid? See if you can figure this out by yourself. Is it yes or no? And see if you can explain it in your own words. Come back when you're ready for answers. Okay, are you ready? So is it a yes or no? It's selected randomly, so it's a good representation of the data. And because Elijah receives the fewest votes, her inference that Elijah will not win the election is valid. Yeah. But why? 
Let's look at this sample answer. Because her inference is supported by three different random samples from the same population that show the same data. And that probably is a good representation of the data. Three different samples um, that are selected randomly. So it's not just one set of data, one set of 20 students selected randomly, three different uh, samples of randomly selected students, 20 students each. So uh, the more the more uh, the more group or the more different samples uh, you have, which are randomly selected, it gets your data gets strong. Your data gets stronger and stronger, and you can make stronger inferences. Okay, let's look at the last tried, uh, last example, example four. Make an estimate from sample data. Derek is writing a report on cell phone usage. He clicks, he collects data from a random sample of seventh graders in his school, then finds that 16 out of 20 seventh graders have cell phones. If there are 290 seventh graders in his school, estimate the number of seventh graders who have cell phones. And now we're gonna use proportion to figure this out, right? So we're gonna solve, write and solve proportion to estimate the number of seventh graders, C, who have cell phones. So seventh graders will cell phones and sample would be 16 out of 20. And if that is a good representation of the population, um, the number of seventh graders in school being 290, we can make a proportion that is equal to to that, 16 over 20, and figure out what C is, which represents seventh graders with cell phones in the school. Uh, so we multiply 290 on both sides so that we can get rid of that. 290 divided by 290 is one. So you get C, one C, which is just C, is equal to 232. If you multiply 290 by 16 divided by 20, or you can simplify your zeros and then multiply 29 by 16 divided by two, or you can also uh, divide by two first and then you multiply eight times 29, that's 232. So based on the sample, about 232 seventh graders in Derek's school have cell phones. Now, why do we say about? Because it's an inference that we make from data. It's not an exact, uh, it's not an actual number. So that's that's a that's an inference that we make from the from the um, representative data. All right, let's look at Tried. For his report, Derek also collects data from a random sample of eighth graders in his school, and finds that 18 out of 20 eighth graders have cell phones. If there are 310 eighth graders in um, in his school, estimate the number of eighth graders who have cell phones. So use the proportion again and estimate the number of eighth graders who have cell phones. Uh, see if you can do it by yourself. Come back when you're ready for answers. Okay, are you ready? So, based on the sample, how many do we have? 18 over 20. Your proportion should be 18 over 20. That's equal to C over 310. And so multiply 310 on both sides. And that's 9 times 32. So C is 279. Let's look at our answer. So based on the sample, about 279 eighth graders have cell phones. Okay. Let's sum up our lesson. So the key concept we learned about um, this lesson is that we can analyze numerical data from a random sample to draw inferences about the population. So the measures of center, like mean and median, and measures of variability, like range, can be used to analyze the data in a sample. Okay, that was lesson two, drawing inferences from data. We'll continue with our uh, next lesson, lesson three, which is, um, yeah, which is making inferences in different uh, situations in the next video. Bye.